How about now? Oh. It's the punk. Going out and reconnecting. It's the punk. Oh, there we go. Woo! That means we're going to have a good shirt. Well, I am glad you guys are here this evening. Welcome to Redemption Community Biker Church. Let's open in prayer. Father God, we love you and we praise you. Lord, I pray right now that you would push out anything that's trying to prevent us from moving forward. Lord, I pray that you would come down here with your Holy Spirit tonight and indwell us. Teach us. Lord, help us to learn something that we can apply to our lives so when we leave here, we can be salt and light to this community. Amen. For we love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So listen, tonight I'm going to give you a break from the bad dad joke. Okay? Oh. 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 See, uh, you see, last week, Last week when I looked out into the, the congregation, you looked sad. You looked hurt. You looked like like I had done something wrong. Okay? So I figured instead of doing that, we'll do some regular jokes, okay? So uh, so a man went into a seedy bar in Massachusetts. Anybody from Massachusetts? Alright, there you go. So he went into one of those bars that Bruce used to hang out in. <laughs> and uh, he went in to get a drink. And uh, when he walked up to the counter, he saw a man that was pretty beat up. And he looked like he was kind of a pirate. Okay? He had a black eye patch, and he had a hook for a hand, and a wooden leg. And uh, after a few drinks, the man said to the pirate looking guy, he said, Hey, buddy, do you mind if I ask you how you got your injuries? Sure enough, matey. The pirate answered. I lost me leg when I fell off me boat. A shark came and tore it from off. A few months later, I lost me arm in a sword fight with another sailor. We were more than a little drunk. He said, what about your eye? The man said, oh, the eye, yes, I lost me eye. When a pigeon flew by, I pooped in it. The man replied, I didn't think you could lose your eye from bird poop. Did the bird have a disease or something? He said, no, not at all. You see, I just caught him up. They were way back in uh, Egypt. You guys remember that? Yeah. 
He told his disciples that it was in remembrance of that. Okay? Now, believers in Jesus celebrate and remember in our case, grape juice as a symbol of his blood. Okay? Very important to point out that the act of taking communion does not save you. Okay? Very important to point out. Alright? It's strictly an act of worship and it's about remembrance. And if you remember, we spent a little time talking about where the word communion came from, right? The word communion comes from the Latin root word communion. I probably didn't pronounce that right, but you know what? We're going to go with it. And that idea, that word means fellowship. It means mutual participation and sharing, okay? The word implies a deep connection, particularly a spiritual connection. In short, it means common union, right? So I think it's fair to say that when we talk about communion in our church, it should be a time when we participate in fellowship with one another in common union with each other and Jesus Christ. It's a ceremony when we share the physical elements of communion with a deep spiritual connection to him and to one another in remembrance of his sacrifice on the cross. And I truly believe that the way we celebrate it is what Jesus intended communion to be. Throughout the lesson, we discuss what communion is, and we discuss what communion is not. And I hope that you are all blessed by the service. Because we're moving on tonight. We're moving on. And listen, what I believe God wants us to talk about tonight is change. Oh no, bro. Okay. God wants us to talk about change. I believe so. And the reason I feel so strongly about this is because something significant is about to change in my life. Okay? I can't share it with you yet. I'll tell you next week. Alright? But listen, God reminded me of something when this change came up. God reminded me very clearly that change is difficult. Change is difficult. Whether we are changing our habits, changing where we live, where we work, maybe we're changing our attitude about something. Change, no matter what, is hard. And especially it's hard when it's imposed on us suddenly or against our will. Are you with me? There are times when change comes about that we're not expecting it. And we don't even want it. But it happens anyway. Many of you know that my family last year was split apart. I didn't want it to happen. But it was forced on me very quickly. And many of you have had similar things happen in your life, right? And so we know that change, no matter what we want to do, is constant. Sometimes, like in my case, it's a change in a relationship. Other times, it's a sudden change in our health. Right? Sometimes, it's a death that we weren't expecting. Jen just experienced the loss of his, her father. And folks, by the way, the only reason I use examples with Jim and Helen and Bobby and Jen is because they don't mind. I'm not going to tell your business, okay? You don't have to worry about that. I don't want to tell Frankie because he's going to share it with everybody. I'm going to do that. Okay, just so you know. But listen, when it comes to significant change, no matter what it is, there's always, always, always an element of pain. There's always an element of pain that comes with change. Even if the change is good. Right? Earlier this year, I moved into a new house. Right? It was great. It was a great change. But it was painful. You know why? Because I'm old now. Okay? I have now reached the age where I'm too old to be moving my stuff myself. Okay? I know that for sure. You know, I, I did it, but I could barely walk the next day. So there was there was physical pain. Literally. And
you know what? Physical pain a lot of times is easier to deal with than the emotional pain that comes from shame. Amen. Right? Yeah. Leaving friends or family, losing a spouse, moving to a better job can be painful. Even li leaving familiar places behind is hard. Right? Heather just went through that when she came to live with me over in New Smyrna Beach. You know, what's funny is many people put off change. They put it off. And they put it off because of the pain. How many people do you know that stayed in a relationship a lot longer than they should have? Right? Because they were afraid of what was going to happen when they left. Right? Or how about somebody that waited to have surgery because they wanted to avoid the pain that accompanies that surgery? Right? You guys with me? When I was about 11 or 12, I got a cavity in one of my back teeth. Okay? That was me. I was Latino back then. <laughs> and uh, now I knew it was a bad cavity because it drove me crazy. I was constantly pushing on it. I knew there was something wrong. And so I told my parents. And they told me, listen, don't worry. It's a baby tooth. It's going to fall out anyway. Right? But it got worse. And it got worse. And one day, I noticed there was a huge hole in my tooth. Okay? And it turns out that I had an abscess. And I had to get the tooth pulled out right away, right? And that's when I discovered the joys of nitrous oxide. <laughs> you guys ever had that stuff? Yeah. It's awesome! They do, they call it laughing gas. The guy was standing on my face, pulling out my tooth, and I was cracking up. I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Right? Anyway, looking back, I can understand why my parents didn't want to spend the money that it was going to cost at the dentist to get a, a filling for a tooth that was going to fall out anyway, right? It made sense. But waiting until it was that bad ended up causing more damage yeah. and actually cost a lot more money to fix. Yeah. Oh, and what's funny is I didn't learn my lesson. See, I thought I'd learned my lesson. But years later, I moved to New York, all right? And I had to get a crown put on one of my teeth. But since we lived in the sticks of New York, and you guys, upstate New York, brother, I know you're coming. Sticks yeah. of New York, all right? I had two separate dentist appointments that were months apart. And they were in areas that were nowhere near each other, okay? And because of the time it took to get the appointments, by the time I was ready to get the crown after the, the root canal, too much time had passed, and I couldn't get it done. And you know, looking back, I could have gone down to a bigger area of New York. They have this little city. Maybe you've heard of it. And I could have paid for a specialist that could have done it all in one shot. Right? I would have paid more to get it done. But I decided to wait, which was not very bright. Because you know what? See that? Yeah. Yeah. Are you with me? That was the two that I paid for a root canal on. Anyway, listen, even though some of these examples that I'm telling you were good changes, not all change is good, right? You guys with me? <laughs> there are many changes in life that are both painful and sad because of the change that takes place. Because it's not for the better, it's for the worse, right? Or maybe the change doesn't fix the problem at all. How about that one? Right? We all know people who voluntarily left their career only to find out that their new job sucks too. <laughs> right? Are you with me? They're not any happier in the new job than they are in the old one. And listen, there are couples that divorce thinking it's going to solve all their problems, but later they find out that their new spouse is crazier than their old spouse. <laughs> right? And getting the divorce leads to new problems that they have to solve. But folks, this is real stuff, right? But listen, before I get too far into this, I want to give you some examples 
of changes in the Bible. Okay? Changes in the Bible. And what we're going to do is we're going to examine people in each of these examples and how they responded to change. Okay? You with me? Yep. So in Genesis chapter 12, it's at the beginning, there was this dude named Abram. Okay? And he liked pork, so they named him Abraham. <laughs> That's not true. Write that down. Okay. But listen, Abram, listen to this. Starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Pretty cool, right? So listen, in this passage, tell, uh, God tells Abram, who becomes Abraham, to leave his country and go to a foreign land, foreign land that he knows nothing about. Okay? And I want you to think about the logistics of this for a minute. I mean, like, as if you were actually going to do this. Okay? First off, he had to get there. He had to pack all his garbage, put it on a camel, right? He had to get there. He had to leave his culture, his family, his traditions. He didn't even have to learn a new language, right? That's painful. He'd have emotional pain from leaving his home and his relatives and his friends forever. And you know what? He's leaving all the security he knows. And he's risking all that to go where God was sending him. It's easy for us to sit here and go, yeah, well, God told him to go, so he better go. <laughs> right? Yeah. Helen just said, yeah. I'll tell you what, Helen. I'll tell you what, Helen. It's time. It's time for you to go to Africa. Go pack your bags. Okay? If you were to do that, though, she's like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> if you were to do that, you'd have a lot of questions, right? You'd have a lot of questions. How am I going to get there? Yep. What do I do for money? What's African food like? <laughs> right? How will I learn to speak the language? You know? <laughs> you don't know. And most of all, who's going to pay for it? Right? Who's going to pay for all this? But listen. So, so it's scary. It's, it's scary for Abraham. Right? But God told him that there would be blessings associated with the change to him. His name and his family would be great. God told him he'd give him many, 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 many descendants. And he said the whole world would be blessed through him. And praise God. I'm glad he went. Yeah. Right? Because today, Abraham is called the father of all of those who have faith. Galatians 3, 6, and 7 said, In the same way, Abraham believed God. That's important. And God counted him as righteous because he did a lot of good things. It doesn't say that, does it? God counted him as righteous because of his faith. God counted Abraham righteous, not because he did good things. He counted him righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. Folks, that's us. You realize that? We are the children of Abraham. We're like the ugly chef children, though. Right? We're not Jews. We are those who put our faith in God. We are blessed because Abraham chose to follow what God told him to do. But it couldn't have been easy. I don't care what anybody says. In fact, if you read the whole story of Abraham, you will see very clearly that it was not all peaches and roses. Okay? Go look it up. You're going to be like, wow, that's in the Bible. We'll save that for another time. Let's move on to the second story. And the second story, hey, oh, that's Jim. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go to the second story. The second story is very popular, okay, especially 
this time of year. Let's talk about it. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And that's how it. Ah! I didn't even play that. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, going through verse 38, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth, Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, maybe you've heard of it, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged, she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, I bet she was. She's like, Did I paint today? Something like that. All right. Mary tried to think what the angel could mean by what they were saying, right? What he was saying. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have been unfaithful with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, well, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Amen. Listen to this. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left. Okay. So from a man's perspective, this is a no brand, right? It seems pretty cut and dry. Angel appears and says, okay, Mary, listen up. God is going to make you pregnant. You're going to give birth to the Son of God. You good with that? Right? That's what happened. But from a woman's perspective, from what I've heard, it's a little different. Right? Ladies, back me up here for a minute. I've heard that pregnancy is hard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> right? I've been told, like, your feet swell. You have weird cravings. Right? You cry every day. And apparently it does a lot of body damage, right? Yep. But in this case, most of us don't realize it, but it's even worse for Mary. You see, she has to go through all that physical stuff we just talked about, but she also has to go around everywhere pregnant out of wedlock. That wasn't popular then. <laughs> Notice she tells the angel, hey dude, I'm a virgin. And he's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Devil of God. <laughs> right? Think of the faith in God that Mary had to have. She had to risk the loss of her reputation. She had to risk getting kicked out of her family. The loss of her fiancé when he finds out she's pregnant, because he knows he didn't do it. <laughs> right? Oh, and by the way, there was nobody that could help her. Because it was the first and only time in history it would ever happen. She couldn't go to some old lady and say, tell me about when you got knocked up by the Holy Spirit. Did not <laughs> Right? There was nobody she could share this with. Who can relate to you when you're pregnant by the Holy Spirit and you're the mother of the Son of God? You got no support system. However, as was the case with Abraham, there were blessings that came along with it too. The angel told her that God would be with her. She was highly favored, right? Oh, and she would be the mother of the greatest king that ever lived. You mothers are proud of your sons, I'm sure, but this is Jesus! Right? Yeah. Or Mexico, hey, Sue, same thing. <laughs> Despite her initial doubts, Mary changed her mind about what God could or couldn't do, right? God blessed her in a way that no other woman in history has or will be blessed again. 
So when you look at these two examples, what do we learn? Well, something I learned is that change was just as hard for the biblical heroes as it is for us. Have you thought about that? It was just as hard for them as it is for us. And listen, those aren't the only stories. God changed Jonah's direction, right? A fish ate him. A fish ate him. That's a lot of change to deal with. Right? It changes direction. Ultimately, it changes heart. Right? Smell bad, too. Right? Listen. God changed Moses. If you've read the story of Moses, he changed him from an Egyptian prince, who was a murderer, by the way, to a Hebrew nomad. How about when he changed Saul to Paul? God changed Saul from a Christian-hating Pharisee to Paul. A tender-hearted believer who brought the message of Christ to us mongrel Gentiles. Okay? Amen. He changed Peter from a lowly fisherman to a bold public speaker who brought thousands of people to Christ. But there was something that was common in all these examples. There's something that's very, very, very common. You see, all of these people had to do something in order to be used. They had to trust God. They had to trust God. You see, Jonah tried not to trust God. Didn't work out too well for him. Okay? Now, as I said, something significant is about to change in my life. Something that causes fear in a lot of people. I'm not dying. It's the first thing people want. Okay? Not yet, anyway. And rightfully so, because it's difficult. But folks, my trust is in God. And I don't say that to show you how spiritual I am, or, or to show you what a good Christian I am. I say that because over the years, God has demonstrated his faithfulness to me. He's demonstrated. He's proved over and over and over that he is who he says he is. And my faith has grown because of what he's done. But also because of what's in his word. Okay? Because the two go hand in hand. A scripture passage that many of us have read more than once is in Proverbs. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path, path to take. We've read that a bunch of times, right? Some of us read it when we were kids, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. It's, it's so simple. But we don't do it! We don't do it! Right? Come on. Do we not try to figure it out? We don't trust in God. We're like, how on earth am I going to do this? <laughs> right? That is what we do. It's so easy to say. But folks, the more we read scripture, the more we trust God in what he can do, the more our faith grows. Because you start to expect it. You just expect it. I've had people go, man, that's amazing. I'm like, actually, it's not. <laughs> They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, that's God. That's what he does. It's pretty cool. And that's why I know that God's got something for me. That's why I know. Here's a passage that may be unfamiliar to most of you. It's in Psalm 112. Now, although we don't know who the author of Psalm 112 is, we can be sure that whoever it is trusts God completely. Okay? Because listen to this. Psalm 112, verses 4 through 8. Light shines in the darkness for the godly. Amen. They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. Good comes to those who lend money generously and conducts their business fairly. 
Such people will not be overcome by evil. Those who are righteous will be long remembered. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. Listen, when I found out what was going to happen, my head wasn't right for a day or so. I know what to think. But you know what? We don't have to fear bad news. Isn't that great? Because we can confidently trust that the Lord is going to care for us. Right, Bruce? Guys, do you know Bruce's story? Bruce, do you mind if I tell it? Yeah, go ahead. All right, let me tell you what happened. So, we had this hurricane like three years ago. You guys remember it? A lot of wind, rain, bad stuff. It, it engulfed where Bruce lived. Engulfed it. Right? And he got it all cleaned up, and he kept living there. But here's the thing. Mold grows over time. Okay? And when this next storm hit, it happened again. And we sent somebody over there to help Bruce to remediate his home. And the person said, this is the worst case of mold I've ever seen. And that's saying something. Right? And we all say, oh, well, God will take care of Bruce. Right? You know what God did? God sent somebody that bought a new place for Bruce to live. Praise God. Bought it. Called us up and said, hey, how much do you think it would cost to replace where he lives? And I said, about this. He said, cool. It'll be in the mail tomorrow. Not joking. Amen. Bruce, am I joking? Amen. And he went from a 1970-something trailer Okay, sorry. To a 2014, right? Guys, that's what God does. That's what he does. Isn't that amazing? No, that's what he does. Right? I got one more passage that I want to read to you. And it's the foundation from which we can build our entire lives. I'm sure you've heard it before, but I'm going to read it anyway. And it's found in the book of Hebrews. All right? Hebrews. Which, by the way, we've been studying word for word in our Bible study on Thursday night. And let me tell you what's going on. Paul is talking to a large congregation of Jews that have just become Christian. Okay? He's been teaching them how they can put aside their old traditions of kosher eating and hand-washing ceremonies and sacrificing animals. And he's telling them that change needs to happen in their congregation if they're going to become strong believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's teaching them. And they're like, I don't think so, bro. That's basically what they're telling them, right? But he's trying to tell them you can't continue to worry about who's circumcised or not. You can't Stop. You have to stop counting your steps on the Sabbath to determine if you're going to violate Jewish law. And you know what? He's asking them to, to change something that's core to who they are. He's asking them to change their identity from Jewish to Christian. And by doing that, they are giving up everything they ever knew. Not a small change. I want you to listen to what he says to them in Hebrews 13. In Hebrews 13, he's teaching them to be followers of Jesus. And he says, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Notice that's the first thing. Keep on loving each other. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own body. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Listen to this. Don't love money. 
He didn't say don't have money. He said don't love it. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. Do you know Jim had pancreatic cancer? Do you guys know that? I don't know about you, but every person I've ever heard about that had pancreatic cancer died. Jim is still here years later. And they found it by accident. Right? God will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Love that. Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow their example of faith. Lastly, folks, verse 8, the most important verse of this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is a verse that we can build our lives on. You see, our circumstances will change. They will. Our relationships will change. Our health will change. Our location will change. Our job will change. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Listen, I found a commentary while I was doing my study on this. And it, and it explained a little bit more about that. I want you to listen to what it said. This statement by Paul helps us look backward and forward so that we can know that God is reliable today and the things he said in Scripture are reliable. Jesus wasn't some trendy, hippie preacher that rose in popularity and then faded away. Jesus always existed. John 1.1, 1, 1, John... 858 say that. He came to the earth in flesh to pay the human price that was owed to God for our sin. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Right now he's in heaven working and interceding until he returns for his people and take them home. That's us. John 14, 1 through 3. One day he will return in glory for all to see Colossians. He will rule as a king and he will dwell with humanity forever. Revelation 22. Folks, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has a consistent plan from the start and he's been faithfully executing that plan. Always keeping his word and always trustworthy. Now, if you're like me, when you're reading scripture, or I shouldn't say scripture, that's, that's not true. When you're reading a book, you just, you read the, the top line that the paragraph's about, and then you move on, right? If you, if you know that, you just move on. Save a lot of time in college, I think, right? But you probably didn't even know that. But my point is that when I was putting this lesson together, above all the paragraphs in the text, it said unshakable. Unshakable. One said unshakable things. Another said living an unshakable life. And another said unshakable hope. And they said that because of what Paul said in Hebrews in the previous chapter, 12, verses 28 through 29. Listen to this. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him. Holy fear and awe. For our God is a devourer of fire. Listen, a simple definition of unshakable is something that is unable to be disputed or questioned. See, people can dispute the Bible, <laughs> it doesn't work. And by the way, you don't have to defend the Bible. Us defending the Bible is like us trying to defend a lion, it doesn't work. Okay. Stay here, Leo. Doesn't work. Alright? And you know what, folks? We can have an unshakable faith. An 
unshakable hope is when you put all your faith and trust in God and God alone, believing that He will do what He says He's going to do according to Scripture. That God will fulfill His promises for no other reason that He is faithful. You see, faith and trust in God is not blind faith. I've heard that so many times. Oh, you just got blind faith. No. No, no, no. I just saw a guy get his house replaced. I just saw a guy that was healed of a pancreatic cancer. My God can do anything. You guys say, hey, we don't see miracles today. Baloney. We see them all the time. We just don't pay attention to them. Listen, back in 2004, I had to leave the Air Force. All right? Even though I hadn't planned to do anything else with my life, I had to leave the Air Force because I had anxiety disorder. Okay? Came to Florida in 2011 thinking that it was a good change moving to Daytona. Right? And I jumped into a work environment that was not positive. We'll just leave it there. Okay? So in 2012, my anxiety came back full force. I'd gotten off all my meds. Right? But what happened was I had to go back on meds and had death on me after that. Last year, my family was torn apart. I moved out of the only home that I had known since moving to Florida, and I bought another house. Many of you don't know this, but earlier this year, after going through some VA exams, my diagnosis was changed from anxiety to PTSD. Right? And next week is another chapter in my life. These are just a few of the changes that have been forced on me over the years. And I'm sure that you have similar stories. But the question is, what is our faith in? Is it in our ability to dig out of the situation? Good luck with that. Okay? Or is your faith in God? See, we worry and we suffer and we're in pain for no reason. God said, cast all your burdens on me. Well, not this one. Cast all your burdens on me. We don't do it. We try to carry this crap around with us. You ever try to walk carrying a couch? It doesn't work. Right? Folks, that's what we're doing when we're carrying these burdens. We got to deal with the God. He's got it. You remember when you were a kid? And your parents were going somewhere. You didn't care. You didn't care how you were getting there. You didn't care what it was going to cost. You didn't care what route you were going to take. You were just going to get there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and if you didn't get there, so what? That's the kind of faith that we have to have in God. Right? That he's got it. But no, no, we have to take care of ourselves. Oh, we can't take care of ourselves. You know what? Each of us is going to die one day. I hate to tell you that. I don't care how much vegan burgers you eat. It doesn't matter. You're still going to die. And you know what? I don't want to trust in myself. Because I can't do it. I am unable to do it. You may not know this or not, but all of us are sinners. Did you know that? Everybody in here is a sinner. And if you're going, not me, yeah, you do. Romans tells us, for all the sinning come short of the glory of God. Everybody's a sinner. But there's a payment that has to be made for sin. And none of us have enough money. None of us. Well, we belong to us. No, no. No, no he doesn't have enough money either. For the wages of sin is death, according to Romans 6.23. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Listen to this. I was reading Romans in my studies this week. Romans 10.9 and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's by believing in your heart, you should be right with God by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. 
Not my good stuff. Well, my good's going to outweigh my bad when I die now. No, you've done a lot more bad than you've done good. Trust me. I gave my happy to this morning with you. No. Trust me. Romans 10, 13. Love, love, love this verse. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Folks, have you done that? That's the question. The second question is to believe. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Is it in you? Is it in how intelligent you are? Is it in your physical prowess? Because I'm going to tell you something. That, in a dollar fifty, I'll get you some Coke. Coke, Coke, Coke. Folks, we gotta stop trusting in ourselves because when change happens, God is the one we can depend on, not ourselves, not our buddy, not our parents, not our money. Oh my goodness, not our money. Money's a tool, that's it. But whether or not you trust God, is up to you because bearing that burden will crush your spirit. I'm going to be up here for just a minute. Brian's been paying the plan for an hour and a half while I'm preaching. I'm sure his fingers are tired. <laughs> but if you need prayer, I'm, I'm up here for you. I'll pray with you. So as the man plays, I'm going to be here for just a few minutes. If you need prayer, come on.
Hopefully when we have a lot of technical problems before the service, we know God's going to do something awesome. You're definitely going to take a picture on that. So Cheryl has a, something she wants to read. So, go ahead, Cheryl. Shout out, you gotta deal with me. So we're gonna pray for these specific prayer requests before we're dismissed. For God says, my house will be a house of prayer. Father God, we pray for Sven. He's eight years old, and Lord, we pray for comfort for him. For the fear and sadness that he's dealing with, with his anger issues. We lift him up to you right now, Lord Jesus. We pray for Virgil, who's sick the flu. We just lift them up to you. We pray, Lord, that she would restore them quickly. We pray for Bill's back. We lift up the surgery that he's going to have for Taz. Lord, for the correct diagnosis and rapid healing. For those displaced from the flood still, Lord, we pray for Joan's daughter, Nicole. Yeah. She's dealing with a high-risk pregnancy right now. We just lift her up to you. And Lord, we pray for you for Lexi's surgery. It went well. We pray for her as she continues to recover. We love and praise you for all you do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, have a great week. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.